Welcome to the next in our online conversation series from St Paul's Cathedral. My name is Paula Gooder and I am the Canon Chancellor here at St Paul's, which means that I oversee the theology and learning that takes place within the life of the cathedral. Today's conversation is with Brother Guy Consolmagno, who's the director of the Vatican Observatory and also a Jesuit brother. Our conversation, as usual, ranges widely, thinking about the importance of astronomy and looking upwards at the sky, the importance of science and how that relates to faith. We also touch on themes of vocation and how you live your life as a Christian, doing what you love. As always, it is a fascinating conversation, and I hope you enjoy listening to it as much as we enjoyed having it. Guy, it's lovely to have you with us today. Thank you so much for joining us. It's great to see you again. I can't even imagine how many years ago it was we first met. I, I, <laughs> yes, let's I, say last year. Yeah, indeed. Let's not count. Much better. <laughs> um, I, you have the most fascinating job title in the world, um, Director of the Vatican Observatory. I think most people probably didn't even know the Vatican had an observatory. Can you tell us a little bit about it and um, what, what your role is? Right. Well, it's very embarrassing that most people don't know we have an observatory because our existence is to show people that the Vatican does have an observatory, that church does support science. Um, actually, there were times when the church needed astronomy when it was reforming the calendar back in the 1500s and they did hire astronomers at that point. The modern incarnation came about in the 1890s, 1891, Pope Leo XIII. He had two tasks in mind. It was at the end of the 19th century that the idea first arose that maybe the church was opposed to science, and he wanted to show that wasn't true by having our own observatory. That built on the work, the international repute of Father Angelo Secchi, who had been one of the great astronomers of the 19th century. The other thing was, that was at the moment when the Vatican was reduced to just the area around St. Peter's, and Italy was claiming it was part of their territory, and the Pope insisted it wasn't. By having a national observatory, they could be recognized by other nations who would invite them to participate as a national observatory in work, such as the, the photographing of the sky, the Carte de Ciel program. So it had these two different ideas. To this day, our role is to show the world that the church supports science. And it's not so much to, to show astronomers because we've been around for 130 years, they know that. It's to show the people in the pews that they should not be afraid of science. And so if you met a person in the pew, because I mean, that is one of the most popular things that people say, isn't that, that you know, you have science mm -hmm. on one side, religion on the other, um, they never, the two do meet. Um, so um, say you met somebody who was one of those classic people who thought they weren't allowed to believe in science because they were a person of faith. What would you say to them? I would remind them that science was invented by the church. Astronomy was one of the four topics you had to master before you could you know, go on to study theology or philosophy in the medieval universities. Many of the great scientists were, in fact, church people. Um, you know, you can go back to Albert the Great, who was a monk in the you know, 12th century. But even in modern times, people like Gregor Mendel, the guy who invented genetics, was a monk. Uh, Georges Lemaitre, the fellow who came up with the idea of the Big Bang Theory, was a Catholic priest. And in your pocket, you probably have a cell phone. And the charger in the cell phone lists amps and volts. Alessandro Volta and Jean-Marie Ampere, both of them were devout Catholics. And Ampere, in fact, was instrumental in founding the St. Vincent de Paul Society in France in the 19th century. How can people think that there's a war between science and faith when faith gives you the reason to do the science? It's because we believe in a world that was created by God that we can spend our life trying to get to know God by getting to know his creation. So why do you think that there is this big gap between science and faith? Um, it's, I absolutely agree with you that for, for me, um, a knowledge of God is, calls us into greater scientific inquiry, um, but that's not how it's often depicted. So why do well, you think that can grow up? There's two reasons. There's the innocent reason and the not so innocent reason. 
I think the innocent reason is the easiest to explain. We learned science in school as a way of getting the answers in the back of the book. That's how we teach science. Of course, that's no more science than learning how to play scales is learning how to play music. But still, people have in their head, science is a big book of facts. We teach religion much the same way. We have uh, you know, a list of catechism questions that you have to get the right answers to, or a list of facts. This is what kids are really good at doing, is learning the facts. It takes a little time to go beyond that, a little more maturity. And most people never get beyond that fact learning in their religion or their science. So to them, science is one book of facts, and religion is a different book of facts, and oh my gosh, what happens if they don't agree with each other? Of course, that's not science, and that's not religion. Science is exploring the stuff we don't know. Religion is getting to know a God who we can never completely understand. You know, I've never had the case where this bit of science contradicted that bit of religion, because they're really not even talking about the same things. But I often have the case where this bit of science contradicts that bit of science. And that's new and that's exciting because it means I didn't know the science as well as I thought I did. So that's the innocent idea. We just, you know, most people have a kind of childlike idea of what science and what religion are. But there's a more sinister idea. And I think it goes back to the 19th century when people were hoping that technology would solve all of our problems. You know, electricity and steam engines were gonna make our lives wonderful. And to some extent they did, but technology isn't the whole answer. You know, Nazi Germany had the most technologically sophisticated death camps. Technology isn't the answer by itself. Likewise, at the end of the 19th century, people misunderstood Darwin's theory of revolution into thinking that we could breed better people in what's you know, been called eugenics. And the church was one of the few places that really stood up against eugenics and said, this is immoral, whether it works or not. You know, the science eventually showed it doesn't work. But beyond that, people who for political reasons, you know, they, they wanted to suppress the power of the church in Europe. They wanted to keep out people with vowels at the end of their names like mine to come into America like my great grandfather did. They would use this, ah, the church is against eugenics, therefore it must be against science as an excuse to fulfill their political goals. There's also, this is a long answer, but you bear with me. There's also some people in the religion side who will use a suspicion of science, valid suspicion of science, because science doesn't have all the answers, and use that as a way of building up their fundamentalist ideas of church as a way of marking themselves as, you know, I'm on this side of the culture war is not the other side as, as a cultural marker. And all of that is really sad because when you lose science, you're losing a really important way of getting to know God. Yeah, I love that idea um, that science is a really important way of getting to know God. Um, that seems to me to be kind of at the heart of what you're about. So, um, the, the thing I remember so distinctly from our last meeting was you talking about the Vatican's meteorite collection. It's the thing that kind of really stuck in my mind. Um, tell us a little bit about the collection and if you've got a current favourite um, part of the collection. Well, um, meteorites are fantastic to me. They, are, they serve to science, to planetary science, which is what I do, the way that a relic would serve to a religious person. The relic reminds you that this person really existed. It's not just a fairy tale that we're telling people, no, that was a real flesh and blood human being. The meteorite reminds us that there are actual planets and asteroids outside the Earth who leave debris that come through the atmosphere and, and hit the ground and occasionally hit a building or a car or something. These are pieces of outer space that are left over from the formation of the solar system four and a half billion years ago. And scientifically, they tell us, you know, what was out there, how did things evolve from what was there to what we see now. Emotionally, they're a touchstone to, I get to hold outer space in my hand. What could be more marvelous than that? You know, come on. The, the collection that we have mostly was the donation of the Marquis de Mouin, a French nobleman, and his widow after he died, who gave us the rest of his collection. About a thousand pieces of everything you could imagine. And this you know, happened in the 19, 1935 is when we got the bulk of the collection. He collected them the good old fashioned way. He was wealthy. He purchased them from dealers and collectors. 
which meant he had a great collection of a little bit of everything. And at the Vatican Observatory, what we do is we make measurements across all the different types to compare the density and the porosity and the magnetic properties and the thermal properties of each different type of, of asteroid, of each different type of meteorite that comes from that asteroid. And we know the connection between the asteroids out there and the meteorites in our labs because we're beginning to bring back pieces of asteroid. Right now, there's a spacecraft that was designed by an old advisor of mine, Mike Drake, sadly died a few years ago, but he designed this NASA mission to go to asteroid Bennu, grab a piece of its surface, and it's on the way back. It'll come back in, uh, in about September of 2023. And in these pieces, we will have samples that we believe look an awful lot like a particular kind of meteorite, a carbonaceous chondrite of the type CM which we've measured in our lab and discovered that it, it flexes when it heats in a way that completely surprised us, but explains a lot of the mysteries of what we saw on the surface of the asteroid. So being able to measure something in the lab and then understand the images we got from the spacecraft, and then to be able to test it when the actual samples come back. Science doesn't get any better than that. Yeah, that sounds like the most exciting thing I, imaginable. And while you're looking at those kind of things, exploring the meteorites, um, what do you think about God? Or do you have thoughts about God while you're doing that work? Well, um, as I like to tell people, I'm, I'm both a nerd and a fanatic. I'm something of a fanatic about my science and a nerd when it comes to God. Uh, so I always think about God in everything I do. When, you know, when I'm feeling rotten, I complain to him. It, uh, he can handle it better than complaining to my neighbor. And he actually sometimes can do things about it. When I'm touching the meteorites and I'm feeling that burst of joy, that's the same kind of joy I feel in the best moments of prayer. When I'm seeing the data from my meteorites and suddenly it all lines up in a pattern and I go on the one hand, that's amazing. And the other hand, oh, I should have seen that. I should have guessed that ahead of time. Look, this is just this and then that. And it all, you know, suddenly the pieces all fit together. Again, there is a sense of joy there. But along with that, solving that little puzzle makes me remember, you know, when I'm solving a jigsaw puzzle or even better. When I'm playing a game, you know, a card game or something with a friend, when I was a little kid playing cards with my mom and wondering, you know, why is this grown up playing cards with me? She can win all the time. And as a kid, I knew instinctively it was her way of telling me she loved me. When I'm playing these games and I get something right and I hear God cheering in the background saying, is it that cool? Let me show you the next one. It really is a sense of God communicating, not only in the, the beauty of, the, of what I'm seeing, but in a very personal way going, yeah, isn't that fun? Don't you love the things I put together? Wait till I show you the next one. Yeah, that's an absolutely fabulous image. And I, you know, I've read um, various things that you've written. And one of the things I was really struck by is, um, in a way, what we've been talking about is you and your work and um, almost as an individual. But you believe very strongly in community, don't you? That community, both for science and religion, is a really important thing. Can you just talk to us a little bit why, why community is so important? Well, there's a very fashionable thing for people to say nowadays that I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious, or I don't believe in organized religion. Um, try substituting the word science instead of religion. Both of them are big structures. Both of them have, you know, horrible <clears throat> bureaucracies that sometimes get in your way. As I tell people, you know, I'm a, I'm a planetary scientist at the Vatican, and day to day in my life, I'm dealing with the bureaucracy that seems to be inordinately too large and too clumsy and gets in my way and run by fools. Why do I put up with NASA? Because NASA was the one outfit that could get us to the moon. You can't get there on your own. Sometimes people think I'm talking about a different bureaucracy, but uh, the, the point is this. I get letters, you know, from people all the time. Every scientist does of somebody working in their basement who's got a grand theory that's going to explain it all, why Einstein was wrong or whatever. And it's so sad because they're very clever people, but they're not part of the big conversation. They don't really know what the words they're using actually mean. They don't know what people have already come up with, what they've already tried, what they've already tested. 
And they've put so much energy in something that sadly is fruitless because science really only progresses when you can tell other people about it and then tell the next generation. But that means you've got to have a community where you talk to each other. That means you've got to have schools where you can learn that language and then where you can pass it on to the next generation. All of that requires bureaucracy. All of that requires somebody making sure that the heat's turned on and that you know the electricity is available for your computers and that you can all agree we're going to meet you know, in Glasgow next year for the Meteoritical Society rather than everybody trying to show up in someplace different. Science doesn't work unless you have a community of people. And exactly the same thing is true about religion. You want to find Jesus on your own by reading the Bible. Where do you think the Bible came from? Who provided those Bibles? Who told you that this was a book that was worth reading as, as a you know, series of scripture readings instead of um, you know, your favorite science fiction novel? I love science fiction, but I wouldn't take it as a religion. You need a community of people to challenge you when you're too complacent, to give you new ideas to places to look you would never have thought of before, to share with you the joy when you've discovered something and you say, oh, I just had this really cool insight. Maybe you've had this already, maybe not, let me tell. It not only is necessary, but it's where you have all the fun. I do science an awful lot for the fun of being able to share it with my friends at scientific conventions. I do religion an awful lot for the fun of being able to celebrate with my family and with my friends the big events of uh, the calendar, the liturgical calendar, which celebrate things that happened 2,000 years ago that I wouldn't have known about if there hadn't been a community of people passing it on to the next generation. And the passion that you talk about with, about both science and faith, um, makes me think of the word vocation. Although clearly you feel called into this um, in some way. Um, but of course, you don't have um, a classic vocation in that you're a lay brother um, and you're a scientist. Um, and I know that I find regularly, because I'm also lay, people assume that I don't have a vocation because I'm a lay person. Um, if somebody came up to you and said, yes, but Guy, don't you have a vocation? What would you say to them? <laughs> The first time that happened to me uh, was when I was a Jesuit novice, already declared to be a brother. And I was working as novices do in a hospital, not you know as a chaplain, but as somebody changing the, the, the bedpans. And one of the nurses said, you know, why don't you go all the way to be a priest? And I felt like saying, why don't you go all the way to be a doctor? Being a nurse is different from being a doctor. Both of them are valid vocations. Being a brother is different from being a priest. Both of them valid vocations. And I happen to know myself, not because I'm really clever, but because God kicked me a, a few times when I was thinking otherwise, that I would probably not make a good priest. I'm a nerd. My experience of human problems and human solutions and what people need to hear, um, well, just, you know, when I was in school and I was doing okay, so the kids who weren't doing so okay would come up to me and complain about their problems. I'd look at them and say, yeah, but I saw you drinking with the other guys last night. What do you expect? You're an idiot. That's not necessarily good pastoral care, uh, but that's kind of the way that my techie brain works. I'm much better at being a scientist than at playing basketball, um, doing social work, doing the other wonderful things that a human being can do, but I just don't have the talent for it. So if someone were trying to explore their own vocation and to work out what they were called to, um, how would you recommend that they began to work their way through that? Because it can be, I, I, in particularly in the Church of England where um, um, I locate myself, um, there is a single answer to the question of vocation, which is um, ordination. And I know it must yeah. be similar in the Catholic Church. Um, so I think for me, the really interesting question is how do we help people to recognize that the word vocation is actually something that affects us all? We're all called to something. But it's about, so how do you help people work their way into their understanding of vocation? Well, you start with the experience that everybody has of lying in bed at three in the morning wondering, what the heck am I doing here? And that's a question that never goes away. You have it when you're 20, you have it when you're 70. The answers shift as your circumstances shift, but everybody 
needs to realize that they're not the only one having these questions, having these doubts, and that it's part of life, just as a relationship with a spouse is constantly changing because both people are constantly changing. And you can't just say, oh, we're married, living happily ever after. It doesn't work that way. It's something you have to continually work at. And then within the Jesuit order that I belong to, there's actually a whole series of things that St. Ignatius had worked out about allowing people tools to discern a vocation. And if I can come up with three points that are really important, number one, daydream. Daydream about yourself in different situations, uh, but then push the daydream beyond the easy part. I want to be a basketball player. I make it to the, the, the professional leagues. I'm making a million dollars. Now what? What are you going to do then? How are you going to feel after you've been playing the same game for 15 years and everybody in the press criticizes you and your bones ache and you're seeing the end of the career? What do you do then? Does it still sound like fun? If it does, because you just love the game so much, that's telling you something. Because point two is look for the places that make you not just happy, but content. There's a difference between happiness and contentment. And that's an important difference to keep in mind. But those two things can be combined with the third thing about a vocation. Never make these big decisions. Where am I going to go to school? What job am I going to take? Who am I going to marry? Never make them when you're feeling down. Never make them in desolation because that's when you're most likely to jump to the wrong answer. I only was able to join the Jesuits because I was in a position. I was teaching as a professor in a small college, small university in America. I was as happy as I ever had been. And that made me say, okay, this is pretty good. Where do I go from here? What comes next? And at that time, my thought was, well, I'd love to do this, but as a Jesuit in a Jesuit school. What I didn't know is that you take this vow of obedience and instead of letting me teach at a school like I wanted to, those Jesuit superiors ordered me without asking to go to Rome, live in a palace, eat that terrible Italian food, look at that boring scenery, and oh yeah, I have to do research on a thousand meteorites from outer space. Tough life, but you know, I've, I've survived somehow. <laughs> You've done it from the goodness of your heart as well. Clearly. <laughs> um, one of the other things you write about, and that's really captured my attention because um, I'm very passionate about storytelling and the importance of storytelling in the life of faith. Um, and I'm kind of re really fascinated that you also talk about science and faith and storytelling. Can you talk to us a little bit about why that's important to you? Well, we can talk. Or I'll just give you an example. In Sunday liturgy you're likely to hear a letter of St. Paul and a story from the gospel. And I guarantee you, when you walk out of the church, you've already forgotten everything Paul said, but that story sticks with you. Stories, first of all, connect in our hearts because it is something that allows us to remember the situation. It's something we can compare against our own lives. It's something where you can tell if a story's got the ring of truth or not. You, you, um, there was, there was a movie years ago uh, um, <clears throat> about a bunch of guys and a bunch of naval officers. And my sister and her husband went to it, and he was a naval officer. So as they're watching it, they're looking at each other, rolling their eyes. And as the couple goes off in the, the sunset at the end of the movie, Nick turns to Sue and says, yeah, that marriage will last about one week. <laughs> because you can tell when a story's got it wrong. You can't hide behind fancy words the way that you might be able to hide if you're a clever writer of philosophy. So I think that's part of the power. But stories, to, to go back to a nerd's example, when we teach physics, we give them sample problems. And then you say, this is the way the sample problem works out. Reality will never be exactly like the sample problem, but it, it gives you a start. Stories are sample problems. Stories are places where you can do that daydreaming I was talk about, talking about and say, okay, if I did this, would that happen? Would this go on? Does that sound right? Am I seeing a truth that I hadn't seen before? And I think part of it too is just my own background. I love fantasy, I love science fiction. I went into science originally because I loved science fiction so much and planets were places where people have adventures. But I also wanted to be a storyteller. My dad was a great storyteller. 
uh, I took a writing class and the teacher assigned me to read the Narnia books. I'm just of an age where I hadn't read them when they came out, they were still too new. So I read them for the first time. They're kids' books. They're marvelous bits of storytelling. And in the process, you know, I could see the Christian analogy jumping out at me because, you know, I was 18, 19 by then. It was not a, you know, a, a naive kid. But I also realized that living the Christian life is an adventure. It's an adventure as real as any adventure you could imagine and as much fun as any fantasy adventure. That was an insight that I didn't expect to have. So you know, story is so rich to me. Finally, you read historical stories, like, like I know the, the books you've written. Um, and you can see in the lives of other people, again, worked out examples. Here's the choices you make. Here's the things that might happen. And you go, okay. In the meanwhile, you keep turning the pages because the stories are fun to read. Um, you probably know that I'm a Pauline scholar, so I'd love to disagree with you on people forgetting Paul, but I can't. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I mean, Paul, Paul is wonderful, but he it's is. not, I, I think it's a waste to read him in, in a liturgical setting, except I, for a few passages. It's really hard to hold what he's saying in your mind. And apart from anything else, his letters are meant to be rhetorical and that they're meant to take you on a journey. Yeah. And if you yeah. read a tiny slice, it gets you nowhere, you miss, does it? Yeah, so, it really, it, it, yeah. it's almost painful. It's like yes. hearing uh, a little bit of music rather than the entire piece. Mm, absolutely. Let's just talk about light pollution now, because I think in a way, what we've been talking about so far are your meteorites, that you have the concrete example of um, the asteroids that are out there, but you must also spend quite a lot of time looking at the stars. And um, those of us who are not experts like you, but actually do like to look up and look at the stars. Um, when you're in the middle of a city, it is incredibly hard to see them, isn't it? Um, do you want to reflect was, with us about light pollution and its impact? There was a wonderful homily that Pope Benedict gave 2012, I think, for the Easter Saturday night. And if you know the liturgy, it's all about the church being in darkness and then the, the fire lit outside the church and the, the Paschal candle lit and a procession of people with candles. You can only imagine what this must have, must have been like back in the days when nighttime was actually dark. But when do we have a dark night anymore? You hear that phrase, it was a dark and stormy night. Nowadays, stormy nights are kind of bright because the clouds reflect all the city light. And rather than being darker than usual because the sky, the stars and the moon are blocked, they're brighter than usual. There's something wrong in that. And in this homily, Pope Benedict says, nowadays we human beings can create lights which blind us to God's lights in the sky. And isn't that a perfect analogy of human sinfulness? You know, the light and my front porch is nowhere near as bright in principle as the light of a star, but the star is so far away and the, 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 the immediate light is so close to me that I can be blinded to the much more brilliant, much more impressive star that's out there. There's something about losing touch with nature that happens when we fill our sky with these useless lights. On top of everything else, the overlighting of cities doesn't do any good, does a lot of harm. There's uh, the fact that most graffiti is written on the sides of walls at night in alleyways that are well lit because the graffiti artist wants to be able to see what he's doing and, and check out if somebody's gonna catch him doing it. That if you have bright lights, you also create dark shadows where people can hide. That if you're driving and you've got bright lights and the car is coming at you, that actually blinds you and you have a harder time seeing somebody trying to cross the street or an animal dodging into the road. The lights also, of course, an enormous waste of money because you want the lights to shine in the ground so you don't trip. I can see that, but why are you shining them up in the sky? I'm not walking up in the sky. There's a, a, you know, a movement now, the, the Dark Sky Movement, the Dark Sky Association, trying to set up regions where we can preserve the dark sky. One of those I was just at a couple of weeks ago in Mayo in Ireland. It's a dark sky site. And they're working in the town of Northport, a little village there, where the church used to have these brilliant lights to illuminate the church so you could see the church from everywhere. But in fact, the lights were so bright 
that you didn't see any of the details, the beautiful stonework in the church. It was all washed out. They're now installing much more subtle lights, which still allow you to see the church, still allow you to walk around without tripping on the cobblestones, but you can now also see the beauty of the stonework in the church. That's what good lighting can do, rather than just saying, oh, there's a problem, turn on another light. It's um, an easy answer to a real problem. And like most answers that are easy, it's also probably wrong. Yeah, no, that's a great image. Um, do you ever find yourself thinking of psalms while you're looking up the sky? So when you're in Mayo and you're in a dark sky and you can actually see mm -hmm. the stars, um, do you have a favorite line from a psalm that comes to you as you're gazing up at the heavens? Right. Well, the two that come to mind immediately are Psalm 8, which the psalmist is essentially saying, God, I'm so tiny. You in the universe is so big. How can you notice me? And yet you do. Um, that's remarkable. And then Psalm 139, uh, you've made me and you know me. You know where I sit and where I stand. Even if I run to the farthest corners of the earth, you still find me. Uh, I had the chance 25 years ago to collect meteorites with a group sponsored by the NASA and the National Science Foundation in Antarctica. Boy, that was the farthest corner of the earth. And yet I felt God very close there. Um, there's, there's an image that comes to me, especially thinking of, you know, us being so small and God being so big. And the more we learn astronomy, the more we realize just how big God is. And, um, you know, I, I reminded of something that I saw written in on the online, an article by a journalist named uh, Emma Townsend, who's, a, I think, writes for the, the Independent on, you know, gardening, something like that. And she'd probably be horrified if she knew I was using it this way. But she described growing up um, as a little girl, she loved her dad. That's wonderful when, when daughters love fathers and vice versa. She thought he was the greatest guy in the world. She thought he was a rock star. He was away from home a lot. But, you know, when he came home, this was really, really wonderful and just filled her with joy to the point that she remembers it as an adult. And then there came a time when she was about 11 or 12, when she realized that her father, Pete Townsend, really was a rock star. He was a you know, guitarist for The Who. He was on tour, which is why he was away from home. Millions of people were buying his records. We are in that relationship with God because we see God as daddy, as Abba, as someone who personally I can talk to and complain about, you know, the bad weather or whatever it is that's bugging me today. And I have this intimate personal relationship and then I realize that this person who is so close to me personally is also the rock star who created the universe. And it boggles my mind. And yet, it also fills you with joy. Absolutely. And there is something, there is nothing quite like gazing up at the heavens to remind you of that, both the, the God of the universe and the God who loves me, um, which is very beautiful. There's, there's a, a wonderful thing that happens when I look at the sky, and I can only relate to myself. Most people go out to the sky, look at the stars, it looks like a big dome, and say, how pretty. When I go out to the sky and I look at the stars, it looks like a big dome, and I go, how pretty, because <laughs> that's what human beings do, yes. especially if it's a good dark sky, and you go, oh, wow. In addition to that, I remember when my father was teaching me the names of the brighter stars and the, the, the basic constellations. And I remember when um, I was learning about these the different, uh, you know, that, what the Milky Way is and what the little cluster of stars over there is. Therefore, I've got this, this personal connection. I can remember being on a mountaintop the first time I saw this. I can remember being with a friend looking through a telescope and seeing this marvelous thing. And there's a layer beyond that, the layer of being a scientist. And I look at that bright light in the sky and I say, that's Jupiter. And I remember my dad telling me about that. And I remember looking at it through a pair of binoculars and seeing the moons. And I also know that a good chunk of my life was spent working on scientific theories, trying to understand those moons. So it's all of these different layers of experience, one on top of another. I think a religious person has the same sort of thing. You know, you can appreciate the music, uh, the, the wonderful music of a Christmas carol. 
you can remember as a child hearing that and all the wonderful memories of Christmas come back to you at that point. You can also, as a theologian, listen to it and go, how beautifully or how badly the poet has managed to capture something really essential about the nature of the incarnation. Yeah, that's wonderful. Thank you. Now, I need to apologize for my final question to you because I know you will have been asked it um, more times than you've had hot dinners. Um, but we're um, doing this film is going out as Epiphany, and there, so therefore there is a really obvious question that I now need to ask you, which is, of course, about the Magi and the star in the birth narratives. Um, would you like to talk to us a little bit about the Magi and the star in the birth narratives in whatever form you would like to do it? One of my first years at the Vatican Observatory, um, I was invited to go to Midnight Mass at the Jesuit High School in Rome. And being a brother, I'm in the congregation, but three of the priests in our community went up there and one of them had a big white beard and one of them was elderly but wise looking and the third one was from Africa. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, the three wise men from the East, there they are. Uh, it's an easy connection to make and they are three wise men from the East. The interesting question to me isn't so much what was the star, because I've heard dozens of answers of what the star was. And I've got a few that are favorites of mine, but I don't know, nobody knows. It could have been just a pious story to, you know, St. Matthew trying to tell us that, that Jesus was as important as Caesar Augustus, who also used astrology to give himself credibility as an emperor. I think it's more than that, but maybe that's the answer. It could be a literal description of a miraculous star that was flying around like a UFO. I don't know, I wasn't there. It could be something that had a completely natural explanation. Uh, some people like conjunctions of planets. There's a theory I love that says it's a conjunction of a bunch of planets all at the same time, rising at sunrise with the sun. And this happens, you, you can work out our, our mathematics and see, yeah, something like that actually did happen around 6 BC, which is, you know, the guy who made the calendar was off by a little bit. We know that. And so that's a reasonable year. Maybe it was that. The real question is why do we care? And I don't mean that in a snide way, yeah, who cares? But rather, we do care. It is a story that has excited people since it was first written. One of those great things about storytelling. Why does it work as a story? What is it that's, you know, at risk or up for grabs? If we do find a scientific answer for it, or if we don't find a scientific answer, you know, if I can show that this bit of astronomy shows that the story in, in Matthew is true, does that validate everything in Matthew? I don't think so, because it's, you know, just one piece that happened to be true. I believe in the other things in Matthew, not because the Star of Bethlehem happened to be true. If it turns out that it was just a pious tale and it was written, you know, tacked on after Matthew had finished the rest of the gospel, does that disprove everything in Matthew? Of course not, because it's still written and it's still there and it still carries this power. The danger is to get fixated on the star instead of the child, because the star is supposed to lead you to the child. And maybe that's really its function as a story to grab your attention and then lead you to the, 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 the baby, because that's really what the center of the story is supposed to be about. Yeah, I absolutely agree. And the, the thing that I, I'm always fascinated in that story is that that's the first moment in Matthew where somebody worships. And of course, at the end, they worship again. So you've got this kind of this bookend in Matthew's gospel about entirely different groups of people, people from the East, Jesus's disciples, who encounter Jesus as he really was. And then they say, the only thing to do is worship. And it's almost as though in distracting ourselves with a star, we we miss the really key bit that Matthew's saying, you know, this is the person to worship. Of course, the real important message of the Magi is that astronomers need myrrh and frankincense and a lot of gold. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's brilliant. <laughs> Guy, it's been absolutely fabulous talking to you. Thank you so much for taking the time. Oh, it's been a delight. And thank you for doing this. Thank you for this whole program you're putting together. It, it's been fun. And I hope, it'll be, I hope other people get a laugh besides you. <laughs> thank you.